This is our news, the weekend edition, and on the broadcast tonight. We've got the latest from the extortion trial of former senator and member of parliament, Frank Smith. Plus, the aviation minister says talks are progressing for management of the country's own airspace. And the Chamber of Commerce seeking to take a closer look at the implications of the Bahamas joining the WTO. news is brought to you by a live Good evening, I'm Andrew Knowles, and thanks so much for joining us. Topping the news tonight, the Crown's lead witness in the Frank Smith trial insisted under questioning during a special weekend court sitting that she told the truth when she told the court that Smith demanded $5,000 from her. Smith, a former senator, is facing multiple charges in relation to an allegation that he demanded $5,000 from a woman for assisting her in obtaining a cleaning contract. Our Jared Higgs has been following the story and he has the latest. The woman accusing former Senator Frank Smith of demanding $5,000 a month from her for helping her get a PHA cleaning contract, telling the court on Saturday under re-examination that she didn't lie when she gave evidence that Smith did indeed demand $5,000 from her. She also told the court that she was telling the truth when she said she paid Smith that money. Prior to her testimony, Barbara Hanna, the proprietor of Magic Touch Cleaning Company, was advised by Chief Magistrate Joanne Ferguson-Pratt not to get frantic and to answer all of the questions asked of her as she faced cross-examination from Smith's defense team led by Jamaican attorney Keith Knight QC. During previous testimony, Hanna expressed disdain at being involved in the matter, telling the court back in November of 2017 that she didn't want to be there and that she felt like she was being used. When told by Knight during the weekend's proceedings that she was being used, Anna denied the assertion. The cleaning company owner was grilled on her conversations with two ministers who also gave evidence in the matter. Knight questioned whether Hannah ever spoke on the telephone with National Security Minister Marvin Dames or Health Minister Duane Sands, to which she replied yes to both. Hannah went on to admit that she was told by Sands to come and see him at the Ministry of Health. Questioned as to which month she visited the Ministry of Health to see Sands, Hannah couldn't recall. The Jamaican QC prodded Hannah, asking if she told Sands that she was applying through a tender for a contract, to which she replied no. Going further, Knight questioned whether Sands ever told Hannah that she should apply. Her response was that wasn't our discussion. Smith's legal team, drawing from Sands' testimony on September 6th of this year, when he told the court, I told her to apply, questioned Hannah again on whether Sands told her to apply for the tender, to which Hannah replied, which tender? Knight responded, the tender of 2017 to which Hannah answered that bidding took place in 2016. Knight again asks if she was told by Sands to apply for the 2017 tender, to which she answered, no sir, I handed that in long time. Later in testimony, Hannah admitted that she gave a campaign contribution to Sands prior to the 2017 general election, describing it as a donation. Asked whether she called Sands on the night of the May 10th, 2017 general election, she told the court that she didn't recall. Asked if Sands called her, she also said she didn't recall. Press further on whether she called Sands to express sympathy for a death in his family. Hannah says she did call after seeing something in the media, but couldn't recall exactly which month. Hannah's testimony on Saturday was that she spoke to Sands two or three times on the phone. Knight turned to a document provided by the prosecution to the defense, suggesting that between January 26th and May 30th, there was telephone contact between Sands and Hannah 16 times. Hannah responded that she can't count the times the phone calls were made, saying she doesn't count those things. Asked if she saw a missed call from Minister Sands or Dames, if she would return the call, Hannah replied, not really. Asked by Knight if getting a lot of missed calls may seem like she was being pressured, Hannah replied, no sir. Turning to the size of Hannah's PHA contract, she told the court that her 2016 contract was worth approximately $43,350 per month, while her new contract, which she was awarded prior to the start of her giving evidence in the matter, was valued at around $155,000 per month. Asked if she applied for a Sandilands cleaning contract as well, Hannah replied yes. Near the end of his cross-examination of Hannah, Knight put to Hannah that at no time whatsoever did Mr. Smith demand or obtain any money from her, to which she replied yes sir. He further suggested that the only financial arrangement between Hannah and Smith was a loan between Hannah and Poolin Limited, to which she replied no sir. 
Under re-examination by Crown Prosecutor Alicia Delancey, Hannah told the court she approached then-Deputy Prime Minister Philip Davis for assistance because she knew he would help. When asked why she approached Sands, Hannah said it was in reference to a lot of pain and hurt. She says giving Mr. Smith $5,000 put her in a financial position, adding that if you have a contract for $43,000, VAT, salary and supplies, $5,000, the court was told, shortened her straight down the line. She went on to say she couldn't pay her VAT or NIB and couldn't stay current. Hannah was also questioned as to a loan between Adrian Smith and Pooland. Hannah says she didn't take the loan out, but she did agree to pay it on behalf of her son. She says every month she would take the $400 to Poulin's office. Rounding out the prosecution's re-examination, Delancey asked Hannah if she lied when she told the court back in May that Smith demanded $5,000 from her, to which she replied, no ma'am, I did not lie. She was further asked if she lied when she said she paid it to keep her contract, to which she again replied, no, I did not lie. The Crown closed its case shortly after that, following nearly a year of trial proceedings. At that time, Smith's attorney indicated that they intended to present a no-case submission to the court. The defense's submission, which is being sent in writing, is due on December 10th. The Crown's lead prosecutor, Edward Jenkins QC, indicated that he could have his response to that submission in by December 18th. The matter was adjourned until January 15, 2019 at 10.30 a.m. with the case expected to resume at the Magistrate's Court on Nassau Street. Ferguson Pratt indicated that she would deliver her ruling on the no-case submission between January 16th and 18th. If Ferguson Pratt rules in Smith's favor, the matter comes to an end. If she doesn't, she has stated that she will immediately give Smith the choice to remain silent or give evidence in the matter. Reporting for Our News, I'm Jared Higgs. All right, thanks a lot, Jared. Well, a viral video on social media involving a police officer slapping a man in the downtown area is now under investigation. In the video, the officer is seen asking the man to produce identification and accused him of loitering. The man gave the officer what appeared to be a passport, which he reviewed. But take a look at what happens next. Don't play with me. Don't play with me. Do not play with me. Do not play with me. Do not play with me. I don't play. Don't play with me. Go that way, please. Alright? Go that way, please. Alright? Go that way. You see that, right? No, why you? Now we're told the video has been brought to the attention of the senior command of the Royal Bahamas Police Force and an investigation has been launched by the Complaint and Corruption Unit. Well, members of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force visiting the crash site this evening to continue their search at, for the wreckage and missing pilot. It's been more than a week since the six-seater Piper Aztec flown by pilot Byron Ferguson crashed into waters off near Banner Beach. Search and rescue efforts by the Defense Force have come under heavy criticism in recent days from the Ferguson family and the public after a team of volunteer scuba divers discovered parts of the wreckage just a few feet away from where the plane crashed. We will have an in-depth look at the search efforts in tomorrow's newscast. In news from the aviation sector tonight, pretty soon airlines may have to pay to fly through the Bahamas' airspace. Negotiations have been ongoing for quite some time now, but Aviation Minister Dionisio Diagler said some critical key steps have recently taken place. Our Kyle Joaquin has the update. I want the public to know that that is very much moving forward. Uh, maybe I had not reported to the Bahamian people um, that, that those negotiations are going extremely well. Millions more could soon be pumped into the public purse, according to the Aviation Minister, who told reporters he's been having meeting after meeting in an effort to seal the deal. Just two weeks ago, I met with the FAA in Miami again. It was my second meeting with them. And we're moving um, quite smartly along with uh, getting an agreement with them uh, where they would continue to manage our airspace. Remember, our airspace is managed by the Americans. And that's not something he said will change anytime soon. And here's why. And in order for us to change who manages our airspace, we have to get the blessing of the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization. And they are not minded to change that. They like the United States managing our airspace. And at this time, they're not minded to change that. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to secure the right to charge the fees, uh, the overflight fees, and the Americans, we will pay them to manage our airspace on our behalf. 
The Bahamas has been in negotiations with the FAA for the past 25 years to gain control of Bahamian airspace and benefit from millions of dollars in overflight fees that are charged to air carriers that fly over Bahamian territory. That seems to be a wonderful compromise situation where it allows us to charge uh, overflight fees and the, uh, um, the uh, Americans will continue to manage our airspace. Remember, about 75% of our airspace is managed by the Americans, and about 25% of it is managed by the Cubans. So it's a complicated, uh, sovereign airspace is managed by two different um, uh, countries. Uh, and, and the International Civil Aviation Organization is the one who will determine, and they do this throughout the world, they determine who manages airspace. In January, Diagler said government hoped to have a stronger definition of the Bahamas' airspace and its boundaries. The Christie administration determined that the country was missing out on approximately $30 million annually in overflight fees. So with this being a long-standing issue, we asked Yagler if there was a timeline or even if it would happen within this government's term in office. Oh yeah, man, I hopefully we'll get that done this year. So um, that, that's moving. Uh, we're in the process. We're about to put out an RFP for a company to help us uh, monetize our airspace. Um, there are companies that are specifically handle this on behalf of countries that are taking control or taking over them, the, uh, uh, the management of their airspace, um, of our sovereign airspace. Um, uh, so yes, we um, you, there should be an RFP coming out shortly. Yes, then. For our news, I'm Kyle Joaquin. The Bahamas Chamber of Commerce has contracted an international company to examine the possible impact of WTO accession on the private sector. Our Gillian Gray reports. As the Bahamas pushes ahead with its negotiations to accede to the World Trade Organization, the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce and Employees Confederation is stepping in to determine exactly how that move will affect the country's economy. The Bahamas Chamber of Commerce and Employees Confederation is pleased to announce that we have engaged Oxford Economics to undertake a comprehensive review of our economy, which will include a complete assessment of the economic implications and impact of WTO accession. Oxford Economics is no stranger to the chamber. It was commissioned to conduct a VAT impact study back in 2014 after the Christie administration announced plans to introduce the new tax regime. Oxford also conducted an independent study for the Bahamas Gaming Operators Association on the impact of the recent controversial tax hike. Bahamas Chamber of Commerce Director of Trade Darren Pickstock said they found it critical to engage Oxford Economics as trade is vital to the Bahamas' economy. Given the importance of trade to the, to the national economy, there has been significant public discourse about the prospect of WTO accession and its potential impact on the economy, businesses, and people of the Bahamas. Therefore, the Chamber thought it critical and necessary to engage Oxford Economics. Pickstock added that during consultations with businesses, there were a number of concerns raised. He said it is their hope that the document produced from this study will not only speak to those concerns, but also cover most of the private sector. The team from Oxford Economics arrived in the Bahamas this week. So far, they met with various government ministries and regulators. Starting next week, uh, they will be consulting with the private sector. Uh, these consultations will take uh, place over the course of the next two weeks. The Chamber would like to thank the government, in particular the Ministry of Financial Services, Trade, Industry and Immigration, and the government's trade team for making available to the Chamber and Oxford Economics the necessary data which will allow for a meaningful report to be produced at the end of this process. The Oxford Economics report will be shared with the government and the government has agreed to review this report and hopefully the government, the government would take into consideration the report in its deliberation on WTO. Once all the necessary work is done in New Providence, the team will be traveling to Grand Bahama to speak with officials from the Grand Bahama Port Authority, Grand Bahama's Chamber of Commerce, as well as business owners on that island. Scott Livermore from Oxford Economics said it is important to prepare businesses for WTO accession. Even if the economy benefits overall, 
as a result of joining the WTO, there's also important other socio-economic considerations to factor in. When looking at WTO accession, it is also important to consider the wider trade and investment and policy background. It is important to prepare businesses for WTO accession so they stand ready to take advantage of the potential gains from WTO accession. That report will be shared with government and it is hoped that the government will take into consideration that report in its negotiations. The study's aim is not only to be a research exercise but also provide input and guidance to the government in the negotiation process. A key element of the study is to develop recommendations that can be used by the government to achieve the best outcome from WTO negotiations. The report is due to be completed by end March 2019 with key elements of the analysis to be made available to the public. The report from this assessment is expected to be released by March 2019. Reporting for Our News Weekend, I'm Gillian Gray. All right, thanks a lot, Jillian. We will take our first break here, but still ahead tonight. Royal Caribbean's president and CEO looking to foster stronger ties with the government and assist in strengthening the country's tourism product. That story and more when our news returns.